Gaitalis. And like Jody Maggio, you've been so kind to receive us, Bocento, on its 20th anniversary here in your house in, in Manhattan. Below us, we have your, what you call your bunker, filled with documents and books and papers, which in your case is like saying that we are surrounded by the history of journalism. So we're going to spend some time talking about journalism and uh, in, on behalf of 1,000 journalists and 16 managing editors and more than 20 million readers, we thank you for your time and your wisdom. Oh, it's my honor, Mr. Luis. I'm so happy to, to see you and to be part of your program. And you represent the wonderful country of Spain as far as I'm concerned, and I'm so thrilled that I have readers there, as you tell me. I hope you're, not tell, I hope you're telling me the truth. If it is the truth, I'm, I'm honored to hear it. More than 20 million. We have in Spain Thank you. because, as, as, as you know, we have uh, 11 regional newspapers. All of them are leaders, and then we have the national ABC. So we have plenty of Oops. new readers all over Spain. I apologize. I'm 90 years old, therefore I get an excuse for not being in Spain. I've been to Madrid before many times, and I love the country. And I wish I could be there physically, but it's a little inconvenient for me now, a little disabling, partly because of my age and because because I. Not feeling too well, but well enough to talk to you and through you to talk to your audience, of which I was with you in person. Well, in the meantime, if you don't come to us, we will come to you whenever <laughs> you want. That's a prerogative of being 90 years old. <laughs> so let me start with uh, the kingdom of the power. Um, you start the book uh, with uh, Clifton Daniel witnessing a, a meeting in Catlett's office, I guess. They were discussing whether New York Times should publish a, a story uh, with certain documents they had uh, that proved an imminent invasion in, in Bay of Pigs, Cuba. That's right. Finally, they decided not to run the story in the name of national security. Uh, just uh, the same moment uh, Daniel uh, came, became a managing editor, he um, apologized for the decision. He said, New York Times should have published. A uh, few years later, uh, the Supreme Court, six votes to three, uh, they ruled in favor of New York Times and Washington Post in the case of the Pentagon Papers. So the first question is, what goes first, national security or the people's right to know? Well, speaking as part of the people who want the people to know, me, I believe that the people's right to know dominates so-called security. The, the question, who, de who determines that is a national security? They're, they're lawyers, bureaucrats, government, government part, partisan government people. And too often they label high security what is not really high security is their definition of protecting their own, their own prerogative. The, uh, or mistakes. The, 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 the mistakes. New York Times very often, the paper of record, the establishment newspaper of my country, Still, it is very connected to government, sometimes in ways that are not healthy for democracy. The, so the, when I was young, when I was a young journalist, I'm, I'm, I'm a son of an Italian immigrant, and my young journalism days was with young reporters who were also the children of outsiders. We journalists of the 1950s, the post-World War II people, I'm part of post-World War II journalism, we were, the, we were outsiders. We were people looking in from afar. We did not identify with power, we didn't identify with privilege, we didn't identify with the establishment. We were journalists of the, of the outsiders. Now that's not true, no, and it wasn't true, it hasn't been true for some time. One of the things, I'm getting off your question, I'm afraid, but let me deviate for a moment. What is, what is uncharacteristic of the journalism that I appreciate is the fact that journalists today are too well educated. They are educated in the elite schools. They go to Yale, Harvard, Brown, Princeton, when I was a student, I was the first of my generation who went to college. Most of us had came from parents who were working class. My father was a tailor. The Jewish people, black people, Irish people, who were my fellow journalists, were also the children of working class people. And we had a sense of skepticism, a sense of, 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 of disbelief in power, and a, and a skepticism of power, and a fear that power corrupted, it corrupted too often, too often, too, too many times. That doesn't, that's not true now. But and when I was young, the names Harrison Salisbury, who went to Hanoi in 1965 and reported that American bombers were hitting hospitals and killing civilians, this was, this was shocking news. Salisbury was considered a, a communist sympathizer for publishing that. And Halberstam, who won the Pulitzer Prize later on, was vilified as the be, well. The best and the brightest. Best the, in the book. Best and the brightest. These were the heroes. Now, now I wonder, 
I'm not, I don't want to be like an old guy ranting and raving against life was better when I was young, but I don't know who the great reporters are now. But again, journalists have to be independent of government. Journalists have to be willing to be, to willing to be demonized as, un, 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 as traitors to the country. The greatest journalists by, by should, maybe should be traitors. I'm not sure you want to go that far because that really should be guided by uh, the new owners of newspapers should be more courageous. But too often the owners of newspapers worry about advertisers. And I guess they have to in a way. The conflict of keeping a paper alive and keeping journalists uh, honest is sometimes in conflict with one another. They have that, to be ready to put their mm, uh, prestige on the line. The journalists. It is, it is very hard. You see the, the, the death of so many newspapers that when I was a young reporter, we had several newspapers, we had several voices of opinion. There were magazines like Time and Newsweek that were powerful. We had other magazines like Life and the Saturday Evening Post. They're all gone now, as you know. The Herald Tribune is gone. The New York Times stands alone, somewhat with the Washington Post in the background and the LA Times a little bit in the third place. The New York Times family that owns the Times, a noble family named Salzberger, a wonderful family, but sometimes their leaders, the, the, men, the members of the family, are, are very reluctant to be perceived as anti-establishment because it is an establishment newspaper and it is also a paper that has had its history of financial difficulty. There's not a newspaper in the world that doesn't have financial difficulty at one time. So I recognize the vulnerability of the press when it comes to, you have to fund for people, that, like there are times that have foreign correspondents here and there and here and there and it's very expensive. And, and they, they do a wonderful job of trying to cover the world with maybe 75, 85 foreign correspondents or more. But it's expensive, I know that. But the expense should not be at the risk of being too, too, too partisan, or too in bed with the establishment power. We are a group uh, filled with uh, local newspapers, so regional and local uh, news cover is, is, is mandatory for us. We've seen in the States uh, in the past years uh, the disappear plenty of local newspapers. And accordingly, we've seen the, the quality of democracy, as you said before, uh, deteriorating all the way. Uh, is there a connection between the lack of uh, newspapers uh, in the region of the States and the, and the quality of the democracy? Do you think that local reporterism and journalism is, is fundamental for the, for the quality of democracy? Yes, of course I do. The, the, the good journalism, good journalism, meaning honest journalism, meaning stubborn journalism, meaning angry journalism, meaning, meaning deviant journalism, contrarian journalism, that is what you need. You have to be fight against those who tell you what you're doing is treasonous, what you're doing is unfair, what you're doing is, is, is uh, against the national interest. Hell with the national interest. The interest in the, the national interest is what the journalist espouses and writes. Journalism have to be kamikaze pilots, go down, go down and explode, the, explode with the story. They have to be daring, they have to be crazy. To be good, you have to be crazy because you're taking a chance of losing your career. You're losing your livelihood. You can't pay the rent. Your wife can't, you can't, can't, can't own a car. You know, all these things are suffering. But you need that kind of journalist who is just, just angry and stubborn, but has a sense of belief in his own, in his own sense of, of, of being honest and, and determined, determined to try to tell the truth. Local journalism is so important because all journalism is local. We all, that was a cliche, but, but to, to some member of Congress once said that. Tip O'Neill, Tip O'Neill said that. Um, we don't cover local journalism probably because, it, because it's, journalism has been limited in its coverage because, because they just are cutting the size of staffs, as you know. At least it's true in the, in the United States. But still, w the reason I think local, local journalism is so important is because Covering an average person's life, writing about it, an average person, not the elected official, not the president of the company, not the surgeon in charge of the hospital, but the victim, the, 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 the patient and the, 
and the subway conductor and the garbage collector and the and the woman who work, works in a restaurant double time to pay her her divorced husband's fees. Um, it, they have stories. The stories are told by fiction writers. My aspiration was to go into the world of fiction and be a storyteller and write what fiction writers write. And the fiction writers, I don't care if you're talking about some of the great writers, they also wrote about local people. Dostoevsky writes about local people, ordinary people. De Maupassant, the great French writer that I used to read as a kid, and social, ordinary people, uh, they are the story. And as a journalist, you can find these characters that are major in fiction, because the major fiction I write about private people. Journalism writes about public people. That's why I didn't like journalism. I didn't want to write about public people. Public people are people in charge. Public people are the people who own the store, or own the government, or own the ball club. I wanted to write about private people, and the people that were private, I always thought of people, if I didn't write about them, they wouldn't be known. I would like to write about people that were never interviewed before. I didn't want to write about people who were interviewed. I want to be the first person to get their story. And if I did their story well enough, they'd get an obituary. I wanted to write about the people who did not get obituaries because they weren't known. And if I wrote about them and made them newsworthy, because if you get an obituary in the newspaper, you have to be newsworthy. Well, who says you're newsworthy? Well, if you get in a newspaper and write about it, then you become newsworthy. I wanted to make them newsworthy. And I did, to some degree, achieve what I wanted to do. But as I said, Melville was not newsworthy. He died and didn't get an obituary until many, many later. I wanted to be, I wanted as a journalist to be a pioneer into privacy. I, because the, the fiction writers, fiction writers had a, had, a, had a stranglehold on privacy. All the great, whether you're talking about Hemingway or talking about Dostoevsky, or you're talking about whoever you're talking about. I'll be a marshal, I don't care who you're talking about. They write about privacy, private people, ordinary people. Journalists, the, the Pulitzer Prize, write about famous people or powerful people. I wanted to be the writing about the non-newsworthy. I wanted to write about a newspaper, but didn't want to write, want to write about news. That's hard to do. But if you do it, you enter the world, you could possibly enter the world of, of literary responsibility or literary fiction. I wanted to, be, I wanted to move journalism into the world of literature. It's not recognized, it's a lower form of literature, some say. I didn't say it, but some say. But I wanted to as, as aspire, I think all your young people that might be listening to us tonight as we have this dialogue, if they wanted to not be fiction writers, not be short stories, not be playwrights, not be poets, but to try to bring poetic life or literary life into the ordinary fact of covering local news and looking for those little characters, maybe in a courtroom, or maybe in a prison, or maybe in a ball yard, or maybe in a parking lot, or maybe in a restaurant, the chef, the waiter, or, or some people that maybe are giving tra traffic tickets in the streets to, 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 to limousine drivers. Those stories could be like, like short story literature. They could be literature. I mean, they can they still be a new, if they're written well, they can be in a newspaper. And if they're written well in a newspaper, they can live beyond, their, beyond the day of that newspaper. They can actually fit into the reader of 10 years, 20 years, 30 years later. Because if the story's written, if it's a short story, many short stories that are 100 years old, 200 years old, are still written with Edgar, Edgar Allan Poe or Hawthorne, are stories that were written 100 more years ago. They're short stories, they're little stories, they're local stories, but they're written in the timeless realm of literary, literary eternity. And I think journalists should aspire to be part of literary eternity and make the little stories, in their head at least, worthy of being read 100 years after they're dead. That's what I, it's a lofty, a lofty notion, I know. It might sound pretentious, but I don't think it's so pretentious. It's possible to do. I hope every single journalist in my group will listen to this answer and learn it by mind and put this in, in practice because I love the, 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 the way you, you answer.